256.
what you're singing on these next couple verses here. Oh, I am my can be dismissed next door. Wait till you're dismissed till I tell you the topic. <laughs> oh yeah. All right, get Genesis 36. Genesis 36. And the topic this afternoon on question and answers that all came in together for tonight. Dukes, dinosaurs, and the deeps. That's what we're covering tonight. So go from mildly interesting to pretty interesting to crazy interesting. All right, hopefully we have time for all these. Get to Genesis 36, and we'll pray as soon as I get there myself. All right, Lord, I ask that you would please bless this evening and the lesson we're about to cover. Um, Lord, I ask that you please help us to uh, see these things in Scripture. Some of us have seen them before, um, but there's lessons in the um, teaching and there's instruction to be learned. I ask that you please help us to take it, apply it, uh, to be looking for it, be thirsty for it. And Lord, I ask that you please bless the words tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, uh, we're talking about dinosaurs and the great deeps, but there is some practical application in that. Um, look at Genesis 36, first of all, on Dukes, just a very short answer. Um, we don't use the English terms. We don't use the English terms of king and queen or princes and then all of the other people that they tap on the shoulder with a sword and they like, I'm not going to cut your head off, but I'm holding the sword the way that I could. I don't understand all of that because I don't have enough English um, blood to want to figure it out, I suppose. I just like their tea when I fly overseas. So in Genesis 36, uh, you have this, I guess, verse 1. These are the generations of Esau, who is Edom, right? So you've got this guy, Jacob's brother. And then it gives you some of his history and some of his uh, lineage. And then look in verse 15. These were dukes of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, Duke Teman. Okay, so what is a duke? Uh, there's a couple definitions. Don't write all these down. I'll give you the last one to write down if you're taking notes. Uh, 1591 definition, a leader, a captain, a general, a chief ruler. And that certainly fits here. These men are not only heads of their families, they're heads of areas, and they're going out and establishing new lands. And you read through the Bible like these are Americans. These aren't Americans. These are people taking over lots of sand and making it their own and building cities and accomplishing something with their life that gets recorded forever. Uh, then the next definition, uh, this I believe is an older definition, Middle English. This is a sovereign ruler. A duke is a sovereign ruler, ruler of a, of a duchy, or that's a uh, territory. A duchy is the area that is ruled by a duke. It's also known as a dukedom and a dukery. I don't know any of these English terms. These were all in the dictionary. All right, so I have never been in a dukery that I know of and never met a 
the guy running the duchy. But these dukes are the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz. So here's your definition that, that fully fits here. A hereditary title, so hereditary means it's traveling through the family, which is certainly the case here, of nobility. Okay, so if you claim a piece of ground and you make it your own, you're the king over that ground, right? I mean, unless there's somebody taxing you, then you're not the king. All right, then the hereditary title of nobility ranking below the title prince. And that's the part that I didn't know because I don't know anything about Princess Di and all of her, all of her situation because I never looked it up. So the king would be Esau. In verse 15, the sons of Eliphaz would be the prince. And then look at the firstborn sons of Esau. Um, I'm sorry, Eliphaz was the firstborn son of Esau. And then under him, Duke Teman. All right, so he is the son of the son of a king. Everybody see that in verse 15? You got a king, you have a prince, and then you have a duke. And that is why duke is fitting there. And that's why 47 men on the translation committee that were chosen to sit there in Oxford and um, Cambridge and wherever the other place was, three place, Westminster. Uh, is that right? West, three places. That's why those men chose that term duke because they are English people writing an English Bible. All right, let's look at Job 41. Everybody's favorite chapter in the Bible, Job 41. Job 41. I have to be careful studying and preaching about the King James Bible. I have so much notes and so many things on it. I have a whole shelf on it in my office. Last night I pulled out a book I hadn't read in, in years and I was just skimming through. Uh, each little section was a section of one of the translators, not all of them, but a number of them. And one of them, uh, his name was Sir Henry something, Se Seville, I believe, and uh, or Savig. Anyways, he was studying late at night and his wife was in the office with him and they had company over. And uh, his wife said, uh, I can never get him to pay attention to me. This was the guy writing the story about him. He said, I will take time to tell you of one event. And <laughs> he tells this funny story. His wife said, I can never get him to spend any time with me. And she walks into his office where he's dutifully studying his book. And she said, I would that I were a book so that you would spend some time with me. And the, the guy they had over for company said, you'd better choose an almanac, ma'am, so that he would at least pay attention to you once a year. And <laughs> <laughs> and then I get home late and tell Beth the story. She's like, oh, I know how she feels. He gets <laughs> spending too much time with books. Look at Genesis or Job, Job 41. Job 41. The topic is dinosaurs. We're going to see if we can find a dinosaur in this passage. Look at Job 41 and look at verse 1. It says, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? Who in the world is this Leviathan? Back up to Job 40 and look at verse 15. Job 40 and verse 15. It says, Behold now behemoth, which I have made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. Who in the world is behemoth and who in the world is Leviathan? Now if you were to study behemoth and you did a word search in your Bible, you would find that behemoth only shows up in one place in Scripture. And so at that point, uh, I don't often recommend that you go to the Greek or the Hebrew, but behemoth is very Hebrew looking, almost like it wasn't translated. It's like a transliteration where those are Hebrew words just, just in English letters. And if you look up behemoth, it means a plural animals. It means animals. Now, How can an animal be animals? Um, you might even say beasts. But that's all you get. That's all you get on Behemoth, <clears throat> except what we have in this chapter, what he's like. In Job 40 and verse 15, Behemoth, he's like an ox in the sense that he eats grass. Lo, now his strength is in his loins and in the force of the navel of his belly. So he's very strong and sounds like he's large. He moves his tail like a cedar. He has a tail that's like a tree swinging around. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together, and sinews is the joints, and that's like the, the ball and joint and the socket of bones meeting together, like in a, um, 
whatever you call that, uh, in your shoulder or whatever. His bones, verse 18, are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. Well, those are quite incredibly strong bones he has there. And um, so immediately somebody puts in the margin that the meaning is uncertain, NIV 1984. In the 1998 edition of the NIV, they revised it. It's a huge animal. <laughs> well, well, I guess they, that's as far as they could figure it out. Uh, does anybody have a Schofield Bible and have a note on Behemoth? I can't remember what Schofield says. What's he have? An elephant. I thought it was the crocodile. Who has the crocodile in their margins? Somebody's got a crocodile or alligator in there. Maybe that's on Leviathan. Anybody ever seen an elephant wiggle its tail around like a cedar? Nope. An elephant as some think. I think Schofield had his doubts. All right. Now, if you wanted to know who this was, all you have to do is read one more verse. All you have to do is read one more verse and you can find out who he is. Verse 19, he is the chief of the ways of God. Who's the chief of the ways of God? Let me rephrase the question. Who's been around longer than anybody else and knows exactly what God is like, knows everything about God, his ways, his thinking, his creation, his words? It's got to be the devil. No elephant wagging his cedar-like tail around has ever thought about the ways of God. Nor has any T-Rex, nor has any, uh, what's the other cool one, the Triceratops. None of them were thinking about I wonder where God was before he created the heaven and the earth. They weren't there. <clears throat> they weren't thinking that. Look at verse 20. Surely the mountains bring him forth food where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. The shady trees cover him with their shadows and the willows of the brook compass him about. He says, Isaac, this sure does sound like some kind of animal. It is an animal. It is. I don't think it's an elephant. It's a picture of an animal, and it's a picture of multiple animals, but it only means one animal for sure, for certain. Verse 23, Behold, he drinketh up a river, and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. Now, I forget which Bible says it's an alligator or a crocodile, but alligators and crocodiles one of those two may swim around in the jordan river do any of those alligators think man i'm just going to drink down this whole river today <laughs> i don't think that's going through their minds maybe a scientist could tell us and confirm that what kind of beast thinks that he can take up the jordan into his mouth and trusts that he can drink all of the jordan river up and doesn't even hurry about it who does that Turn to Revelation. Hold your place in Job, because I want to get to Leviathan. And I will get to dinosaurs, but we haven't seen a dinosaur yet. Not in Scripture. Look at Revelation 12. Revelation 12. And verse 13. Revelation 12, 13. It says, And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished three and a half years. A time plus two times is two is three, and a half a time is three and a half from the face of the serpent. Verse 15. And an elephant cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the river. And a crocodile, no. Who is this? It's the serpent that was just referred to as a dragon cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the what? Of the flood. And then where did he get this flood? He got it from a river. And where are we? We're in the nation of Israel, obviously. This is all taking place in the tribulation time. Go back to Job. Go back to Job. And in, look 
at verse 41 again. <clears throat> Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Now, you have to change your mind thinking. Some people have to change their minds thinking after growing up in church your whole life. You get this idea that if the Bible makes Baptist sense, then it's right, and if it doesn't make Baptist sense, well, it really meant what we believe, right? So when you read the Bible, you're like, can you draw a Leviathan with a hook? I don't know what that is. Where's this dinosaur stuff? Okay, with a cord with Sal S down? I don't know, a uh, dinosaur. Where's the dinosaur? Put a hook in his nose or bore his jaw through with a horn, thorn? No, you can't do that because he's a dinosaur. Will he make many supplications? Uh, nope. Will he speak soft words? Nope, because he's a dinosaur. And you read through the whole thing and you're like, I know it's a dinosaur because Kent Hovind, Ken Ham, Henry Morris, and all the rest of the buddies all said, they're not buddies, but all the rest of those guys said, that it's a dinosaur, so obviously I'm going to read that into this. Let's not read that into this, and let's see what we have. Look again at verse 1, fourth, third, fourth time we're reading this. Somebody is implying that it would be a foolish thing to put a hook in the water and try to catch this thing. Now, why would you ever think of that unless he is swimming around in a big, old, large body of water, right? So somebody's implying, hey, can you put a hook out there and catch this guy? The obvious answer is no, but why are we talking about putting a hook in water unless this thing is swimming around in water? Can you catch his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Anybody ever caught a fish and it was hooked on the tongue? Yeah, okay. Can you put a hook into his nose? I've caught fish that way. Or bore his jaw through with a thorn? If you look up an ancient uh, fish hook, it, I don't know if I have it drawn in my Bible, but I don't dare try it here in front of everybody. If you could picture a little twig this long and a little thorn sticking off this way and a little twig this way stitched to kind of hook, get caught anything on there so it can't back out and then just wrapped with some kind of thread and then that tied to a thing. Can you bore his jaw through with a thorn? Implied answer is no. Is he going to make any supplications? No. Look at verse 7. Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons? Well, bar barbed irons are used by fishermen on fishing vessels to go capture large fish, to go spear large fish. Can you fill his skin with barbed irons or his head with fish spears? Implied answer through the whole chapter is no. Lay thy hand upon him, remember the battle, do no more. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a proverb. It's like, go out and fight with this guy. If you can get close enough to touch him, you're a dead guy. Goodbye. That's what that verse says. Remember the battle, do no more. All right, behold, verse 9, the hope of him is vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? That means that somebody would faint if they even saw him. No, that's not what that means. Cast down, that means you're knocked down, probably killed, because the verse previous just talked about being killed. At what? Just being in his presence and seeing him. The Bible describes the devil as a great red dragon who's deceived all the nations of the world. On top of deceiving all the nations of the world, he's deceived the whole entire religious system. The whole political system is in a mess. Everything we talked about this morning, that there's no hope in any of these things in the world. Who is behind orchestrating all of that? If you could see Satan for what he is, if the curtains of heaven were drawn back, so to speak, and he was revealed to you in all of his spiritual power, not as an angel of light that came to deceive Eve in the garden and tricked her and was probably very beautiful or handsome or whatever you call him, if not that image of him, the true image of him, if you could see that, you would be cast down, according to Job 41.9, at the sight of him. None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? Now, this is a dinosaur. Don't you know that there was some guys like David's Mighty Men that would go out there and play tag with these guys and go chop off their toes and, until they... I mean, don't you know? These guys are killing 600 guys in one day or however many and take, jumping into pits with lions and fighting them in a snowy day just for something to do, apparently. None. There's nobody ever. Not even Og the Giant who had the 13 and a half foot bedstead. Nobody is so fierce that dare stir him up who then is able to stand before who? Me, referring to God. God is not comparing himself to a dinosaur. He'll compare himself to a dove, not a dinosaur. He's comparing himself in power to the devil. Who then prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven 
is mine. I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely, he's good looking, comely, proportion, fitting, powerful. Who can discover the face of his garment? Who can come to him with his double bridle, like you're going to tame him and get some work out of him? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride, shut up together as with a close seal. Do dinosaurs have scales or do they have skin? Or do they have both? Do any dinosaurs have scales? It's hard to tell after 66 million years, but I, sh I should look that up and then I'll say more about it. This beast has scales and dragons have scales and the dragon is described in the Bible. Uh, verse 17, they are joined one to another, they stick together, they cannot be sundered. They cannot be sundered. Look back at chapter 40. Look at verse 19 again. This beast here, this animals, plural, behemoth, he is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword approach unto him. So there is somebody that can approach to him. It's the sword of the Lord that can get in between those scales and the joints and the marrow, and he can cut them to pieces. And he does that in Scripture. I'll show you that in a minute. Verse 18, by his kneesings, that's, a, that's literally the same word we use today, to sneeze. By his kneesings, a light doth shine. So here's a fire-breathing dragon. And his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth goeth burning lamps. Again, fire-breathing dragon, or he's smoking Marlboros, depending on how you want to preach it. And sparks of fire leap out. Definitely Marlboros if you're south of the Mason-Dixie line. Verse 20, Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of a seething pot or a cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. Four verses on him breathing fire. In his neck remaineth strength, and sorrow is turned into joy before him. We've covered that. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They're firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. So the scales are called flakes. His heart is as firm as stone. Yea, his heart is a piece of the nether millstone. Now that has to be literary poetic, right? Not a trick question. That's poetic. Nobody's heart is as hard as a literal stone unless it's in the spiritual context. Break up the fallow ground of your heart, right? And his heart is like a piece of stone, is hard-hearted. We're not talking about a dragon. We're talking about a spiritual problem in the universe. And his name is Leviathan. His name is the devil. When he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breaking, they purify themselves. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold the spear, the dart, nor the herbergeon. He esteemeth iron as straw and brass as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp pointed things upon the mire and doesn't even care to walk on them. 31. He maketh the deep. The deep. That's our next question here in a couple minutes. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. That means white. You'd think that the blue sea was actually... Uh, white as snow because he is stirring it up like a boiling pot of water. Upon earth there is not his like who is made without fear. Verse 33. Upon earth there is not his like. I.e. I'm sorry to disappoint you. It is not a dinosaur. He does not exist on earth. Now he's like something on earth. The Leviathan here is like something on earth. But no dinosaur, verse 34, beholdeth all high things and is a king over all the children of pride. It's not the dinosaurs. If you were to guess an animal, the best guess would be Psalm 104. Turn to Psalm 104. I'm a little passionate about this because I got tricked until I was 19 years old into thinking this was a dinosaur. <clears throat> it kind of bugs me that I wasn't smart enough to see it on my own because I never read Job 41 as if it actually meant what it said. I read it as if it meant what Ken Hovind meant that it said. 
or when I was in high school, Ken Ham. I think those are good guys. Ken Ham has a good uh, ministry, and he has a um, the boldness to debate public, you know, publicly famous people, and stands up to them in debate. And uh, he's does he have a part in the the big arc thing? Is that Ken Ham's deal? Yeah. So, I mean, I I'm not against the guy at, at all. Um, but you have destroyed a teaching in the scripture about the most powerful being in the universe by just saying it's always dinosaurs, it's only dinosaurs. And you missed out on something about who the devil is and the effect that he has in your life today and on the entire world. Look at Psalm 104. He is like an animal. And that's why he's compared to something swimming around in the ocean that you might try to catch with a hook, but you'd be foolish if you did. Psalm 104 and verse 25 Psalm 104, 25, So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable. Still haven't found all of them today. Both small and great beasts. There go the ships. Where are we? We're in the sea. We're in the ocean. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan, whom thou hast made to play therein. So is that the Leviathan, the devil, swimming around next to the, you know, He's the one that really sunk the Titanic. There's the end of the conspiracy. No, that's not the devil. That's the Leviathan. And the Lord made the Leviathan to play therein. When you have the first chapter in Genesis, you have a count of creation. You have a bunch of things being listed on this huge scale. The universe, the stars, the atmosphere on earth, these waters that are getting separated, trees, life coming, man being formed. And then it says in verse 21, and God created great whales. The only creature listed specifically in Genesis 1, the only animal specifically listed is whales. A very specific type of animal, a mammal they call it today, swimming around in the ocean. Why would God list only one animal of all the animals? Why him? Why not in God made sea turtles? I like sea turtles. They're cool to watch. I'd like to find one someday and hop on top of them if I don't get in trouble. Is that illegal to hop on a sea turtle? Yeah, just don't put it on Facebook. And God made cute little lambs, right? I mean, sure, he could have mentioned lambs. He spent so much time talking about sheep all through the Bible. No mention in Genesis 1 of anything specific except whales. Well, do you know the largest animal on this earth? The largest animal on this earth is not the Triceratops. The skeleton of the world's largest Triceratops goes on sale. Did you guys catch the sale? It was just September this last year. No, nope, you guys missed it. They were estimating that it would cost 1.2 million euros. I don't know what it's sold for. He has three, three horns, a parrot-like beak, and a frill that could span nearly one meter. I think that's the big shell thing that's around his head. His name is Big John. He's the biggest triceratops specimen ever found, weighing in at a length. Oh, where's his weight? I don't have his weight here. His length is eight meters. So what's eight times three and round up? 25, 26 feet? He's 26 feet long. That's pretty big. What's the largest complete dinosaur skeleton ever recovered? This is a 90% complete dinosaur, which I'll call that way better than half. We're doing well there. If you read and read and read and read, this is the Tyrannosaurus rex Sue, The largest one ever found. And her length, Sue has a length of 12.3 meters. That's 40 feet. That's 40 feet long. She stands 4 meters tall. That's 13 feet tall. Uh, oh, that's at the hips. I don't know why they're measuring to her hips. I hope she doesn't mind. It has been estimated <laughs> between 8 and 14 metric tons as of 2018. In 2011, other size estimates ranged between 9 and 18 metric tons. Um, so they, they take these 
skeletons and then they say it could have weighed yeah if it was overweight and watching disney all day it could have weighed that much but it didn't and then they get their estimates back down and then they tell you look at this dinosaur here look at this bronchiosaurus dinosaur this massive brontosaurus that never even existed they proved that after i was out of elementary school uh, look at these dinosaurs that are hundreds of feet long and then the evidence for that dinosaur is a bone of a toe or a leg bone it could have been a leg from goliath's brother-in-law you don't know where that leg bone came from but you're going to turn it into a 200 foot long dinosaur do you know what the largest animal is the largest animal is the blue whale the largest one they've ever found is 29.9 meters long, 30 meters long, which is about 100 feet. And he weighs 199 tons, or she, I don't know if they asked or told, but this thing weighs in around 200 tons and is no match for the largest anything they've ever found. Now, somebody says, well, what in the world are these dinosaurs? What are these dinosaurs? Um, how long did Methuselah live? 969. Anybody know Adam? 930. 930. Just almost as long as Methuselah. Uh, how about the guy that had his life cut short by a rapture, Enoch? 365. Boy, there's got to be something in there. Somebody please find out why 365 is the years that match the days in our calendar today. Um, so we can get out of here and know when we're coming home sooner. <laughs> Enoch was just a young pup in the prime of his life at a, at a young old age of 365, right? And he gets called home way premature compared to his grandfather and uh, son and grandson Lamech and Methuselah. But then what happened after the flood? Uh, well, if we just take a couple, for instance, Abraham lived to be 175. Isaac lived to be 180. Uh, Joseph lived to be 110. Uh, Jacob stood before Pharaoh at 130 years old and said, Pharaoh, on this day, 130 years old. Pharaoh's like, how old are you? <laughs> 130, and that's getting up there. And then what do you have after that? Well, then they just keep diminishing all the way down, all the way down. Then you read, have you read how old those kings were? And he was 15 when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years, and he died. And you're like, oh. Don't be a king in Jerusalem. Back in the <laughs> it's not the way to have a long life, and they weren't honoring their parents or something. So what happens to the animals? Well, I said the largest whale that we've ever found that we have today is 30 meters long, right? But uh, if they were to find a larger dinosaur, I'm sure there's a larger whale because everything was larger back then. What if you took your little iguana that grows to the size of its cage and you let your iguana live for a 1,000 years? 969 years but don't lizards live longer than mammals if we're i don't classify as a manual a mam mammal but we are according to the science so we'll use their term do lizards live longer than us don't crocodiles live like a couple hundred years sometimes i don't know how they like know that does anybody know how they date that <laughs> that's what it is just ask them how many birthdays have you had. So if Methuselah is living in 969, or let's just say maybe an average of 800 years back then, from that list we have in Genesis, how long are these reptiles able to live? If they're able to live two to three times longer than us. And how large are they able to grow? Some of them grow to the size of their environment, with no limit on that. One more factor, which scientists, falsely so-called, fail to con consider because they think that all things continue as they were right since the beginning of creation they haven't continued as they were there's a reason for the lifespan difference between Abraham say and Adam because there's a giant global flood that took place and something drastically changed in our earth's system and in the whole atmosphere and everything else so what changed uh, let me finish on Leviathan and then we'll look at what changed go back to Psalms and look at Psalm 74, Psalm 74, here's 
usually skip over this verse, but then everybody asks me about it afterwards, so I'll just read it to you, and then I'll say, I don't know. Psalm 74, verse 13, Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. What sea are we talking about? I have no idea. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Oh boy, this isn't one dragon. He's got some buddies. And he doesn't just have one head, he has heads. Anybody ever read of a seven-headed dragon in Scripture anywhere? Well, here we go. What's his name? Verse 14, Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan. Did you notice heads is plural and Leviathan is singular? There's a multi-headed beast swimming around in the seas. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. He was chopped up and delivered as food by a local Uber driver in the Old Testament. How in the world did that happen? I don't know. That's just what it says. Turn to Isaiah 27. Turn to Isaiah 27. If you want to know who Leviathan is, you could type in Leviathan on your phone. You come up with these four references, Job 41, Psalm 74, Psalm 104, and Isaiah 27. And then this would be your key verse in defining who he is. <clears throat> Isaiah 27 and verse 1, In that day the Lord, shall, the Lord with his strong and great sword, there's the sword again, shall punish Leviathan the piercing serpent. We read he was a serpent in Revelation 12. Even Leviathan, that crooked serpent. We read about a serpent in Genesis 3 that deceived Eve. He shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. We read about a dragon in the book of Revelation and also in the book of Daniel. He shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Well, what in the world kind of sea is he in? Well, this isn't the whale anymore. This isn't the whale swimming around in the ocean. This is a dragon that's swimming around some kind of spiritual power that he has as a uh, wicked and um, powerful being that the Lord created. And because of what he did, he's going to be punished for that. So where is he swimming around? Well, that brings us to our last question. we got the dukes, we got the dra dragons, or dinosaurs, and then we got the deeps, the deeps. So turn to Genesis 8. Turn to Genesis 8 and see if we can find out where this guy's swimming around. It's no wonder that in the 1500s they thought that there were dragons and sea monsters. Yep. Particularly on, say, Peter Anderson. Yes. Yeah, you'll see why in a couple verses here. See another evidence of that. Genesis 8, look at verse 2. This is after the flood here, but it's referencing before the flood. So God remembered Noah, verse, verse 1. And then it refers to before the flood, verse 2, the fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained. Go back to 7.11. This is what it's referring to. Genesis 7, verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. And the windows of heaven were opened. So we have a couple things in here. We have fountains, we have a great deep, and we have the windows of heaven. Uh, we have the great deep mentioned in Genesis 1, 1, or 2, Genesis 1, 2. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. There was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of of the deep. Turn to Proverbs 8. The Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8. And you should have Proverbs 8 and wisdom like synonymous in your mind. 
This is one of the wisdom chapters in, in Proverbs. <clears throat> so that's our context. Look in verse um, 22. Proverbs 8, 22. The Lord possessed me, wisdom, in the beginning of his ways, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was there right away in the beginning. And wisdom was there already from everlasting. 24, when there were no what? Depths. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no what? Fountains abounding with water. Fountains again are connected to the depths. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills, was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, plural, I was there. When he set a compass, that's a circle, when he set a compass upon the face of the depth. Where did the Spirit of God move? On the face of the waters. And then we move down. Verse 28, when he established the clouds above, he strengthened the fountains of the deep. We're talking about above, fountains of the deep. Then we move down again, 29. When he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment when he appointed the foundations of the earth. So you believe the earth has foundations? Of course it has foundations. The Bible says it has foundations. And how would you know you haven't drilled nine miles yet? You've made it seven and a half or eight and a half. When he gave to the strengthen the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of the earth. Did that say that the face of the depths and the had a compass. Compass is a circle. And you have two choices to believe in your Bible here. You can go two ways with this. You can say, I'm not even going to write it on the board because I don't want to. You can say that the earth is flat and that it's bound by a compass because he set a compass upon the face of the depths. Or you can say that this compass is encompassing some water, a bunch of water, and that that water that's encompassing was there in Genesis 1-2. And how did it get there and why did it get there? Please refer to last week's lesson. Last week's lesson, it was not there on good things. Probably why he mentioned whales. So you can have an ice wall and you can have Antarctica and the compass on the face of the depth. I drew this in the wrong place. Or you can have a compass that encompasses a bunch of water. You say, really? Really? How many of you were with, here, with us last week when we read Psalm 36 and Psalm 148? Okay, and we talked about the waters above the heavens. Turn to Psalm 148 if you weren't here last week. Turn to Psalm 148. Verse 4, we're not going to go through the whole thing again, but it comes down through that, uh, from the third heaven all the way down. Praise Him. Verse 1, the heavens and the heights, the angels in verse 2, sun and moon in verse 3. We're moving on down. Praise Him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Waters that be above the heavens. Well, where's the earth? God took the earth and He separated the waters from the waters. He put waters above, Psalm 136. It says there's waters below. There's also waters below in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not make any graven image of any likeness of anything that is in the heavens above or that is in the waters under the earth. What in the world waters under the earth are we talking about? It's these waters here that got separated in Genesis 1. Look at Genesis 1. Genesis 1. If you did not hear last week's lesson, you have to refer to last week's lesson because I'm skipping things. I'm not proving everything here like we did last week. Look at Genesis 1, 
Look at verse 6. God's already divided the light from the dark. He's making a bunch of divisions now because God likes to divide things. He has to divide things because of evil in the world. Verse 6, God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it, the firmament, divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divide the waters, which were what? Under the firmament from the waters, which were above the firmament. Here's a firmament. What is in the firmament? Anybody remember from last week? Birds and stars. There's birds in the first heaven, and there's the stars also in the second heaven. Okay, this is the first, this is the second, this is according to Paul in the New Testament, and this is the third, where God's throne is, the face of the deep is frozen, Job 30 something, Job what? I looked it up and didn't write it down, 30, 38 or something like that face of the deep is frozen. God sitteth upon the sea of glass in heaven. And I don't know what's above there except that it's frozen and it's a sea of glass and you're not going to get through. I know that. Does anybody know how to draw a dragon? Where's that dragon swimming around? I'm going to draw a dragon here. There we go. And there's his neck and then he's got like, like a bunch of heads up here. Do dragons have big feet or do they have like T-Rex feet? Do anybody know? <coughs> I'm going to give him a tail like a cedar. I'm going to give him some scales. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. And I'm going to have him breathing fire out of his breath. Like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all of us non artists I asked for volunteers. Kind of looks like a chicken up here more than a dragon. But. Oh, there we go. There you have it. Maybe we should draw a chicken under here. Don't make any likeness of anything that is under the earth. Or that is in the waters below the earth. I don't know. Turn to Second Kings seven. Second Kings 7 and verse 1. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord. Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel. Now that's a bargain discount deal rate because they've been in starvation. Their city has been surrounded. You read the previous chapter. They have been besieged and everybody's starving. He says, Tomorrow you could buy flour anywhere for a shekel. Find it all day long. And two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. And everybody hearing this is thinking, obviously they're all thinking, this is impossible. We've been besieged. And there's a miracle if you know the story. The, the enemy heard something in the middle of the night and they all left. But the king doesn't know this. Nobody knows this. And it hasn't happened yet. Verse 2. Then a lord on whose hand the king leaned just one of the guys, his advisors, answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? Why did he have to say that? Of all the things he could have said, he could have said if pigs could fly until the cows come home 
He could have said any of those other catchy phrases. It's like herding cats. He could have said anything, but he said, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? That's as likely as it's likely that there's windows in heaven. And he said, Elijah said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. And there were four leprous men. How many know the story? There's four leprous men. I love this story. Man, if we sit here, we're going to die. If we go into the hand of the enemy, we're going to die. If they capture us, they might kill us, but we might, they might give us a meal to eat, and we might live, but we're going to die for sure if we sit here. Let's take a chance. Isn't that the story of life? You can sit here till you die and do nothing, or you can take a chance and risk it, and you might die anyways. <clears throat> All right, well, they go in, they get some food, then they come back, tell the king. Nobody believes them, so they send out, what is it, two horses, I think. They send out a couple horses, uh, five horses, in verse 13. And then they come back and say, yep, there's food everywhere. They left in the middle of the night. They all got scared like they all heard the same thing. Verse 16, and the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians, so a measure of fine flour was sold for, oh, look at that, a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. And the king appointed the Lord, on whose hand he leaned, to have the charge of the gate, Boy, watch out when Rehoboam sends you to the gate or when this king sends you to the gate. That is a bad place to be in a riotous time. And the people trode upon him in the gate and he died. <laughs> Whoever wrote Second Kings had to be chuckling when he penned those words. And the people trode upon the gate and he died. As the man of God said who spake when the king came down to him. And it came to pass as the man of God had spoken to the king saying... Two measures of barley for a shekel and a measure of fine flour for a shekel shall be tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. And that Lord answered the man of God and said, Now behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see with thine eyes, but not eat thereof. And so it fell out unto him, for the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died. <laughs> Why did he die? Because he opened his big mouth in disbelief to the words of God and said, I do not believe that there are windows in heaven. Say, where are those windows in heaven? When God wants to open up the windows of heaven and he can dump down some stuff from heaven, all he has to do is crack the windows and he can send whatever he wants from his windows of heaven. Turn to Malachi. Turn to Malachi 3. It said in Genesis that when the flood came, the Lord opened the windows of the heaven and the fountains of the deep. Ken Ham and Ken Oven say that there was an earth crust around the earth and that there was water in between two layers of crust and that the fountains of the deeps were the crust breaking and the land masses sinking and shooting water into the stratosphere, which then instantly froze it and it came back down and froze the woolly mammoths that you found with food in their stomachs, right? Listen. I wasn't there. I don't know. All I have is a Bible. I don't care if Ken Ham or Kent Hovind or Henry Morris is right or if my preachers in Florida were right that lived right down the road from Kent Hovind. I don't care who is right. I want to know what the truth is in the Bible. And every time I find these deeps, and I showed you the depths, I find that the fountains of water are coming out of here. And these great fountains of the depths are opening up. And you say, how in the world did they get to the earth? How does the Lord get to the earth? Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. He maketh the clouds his chariots. How does the Lord get to the earth? He travels from here through a cloud to here. You say, that doesn't make any sense. It couldn't make any sense. We're not talking about three dimensions. We're talking about God. How did the water get from here to here? Through clouds, from fountains, from windows, from the depths. And it didn't say depths in Genesis 7, 1. It said the great depths. That's not the Indian, the Atlantic, or the Pacific. Because those weren't there. Those created those. Now, when God wants to open the windows of heaven, he can send whatever he wants through there, and he can add energy to his universe. Turn to Psalm, or Malachi 3, and we'll close here. Malachi 3. Malachi 3.8, will a man rob God? 
Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Verse 9, Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. What was the nation of Israel supposed to be doing? They're supposed to be offering the sacrifices. They're supposed to be having the feast of ingatherings and the first fruits. And they're supposed to be bringing some of their food to the priests so that the priests could eat. That's the storehouses. It wasn't money. It wasn't passing an offering plate. It was literal food stacked up in a building so that people could eat year-round. And they were supposed to bring a tenth of it and other, and more than a tenth. But here's the tenth. Verse 10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat, that's food, that there may be meat in my house, that's crops from the field. And then he says this, and prove me now herewith. Herewith what? You giving up something that you think you need. It would be foolish for you to go into your stores and rake out a tenth of it and basically throw it away. I mean, it's giving it to somebody else, but you don't have it, right? And the Lord says, take that and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. You say, Isaac, why are we talking about tithing? We're not. Just keep reading. If I will not open, see, see, prove me, and say, and see, if I will not open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Kind of like in the flood of Noah's day, and there wasn't room enough to receive it. And every mountain was covered, and there was no place except for the man that was prepared by God to receive it in God's timing with God's judgment. And he escaped God's judgment. And the thing that was everybody else's condemnation was his mercy because he prepared. And the Lord says, you can trust me because I have these bountiful things up here that I have in this spiritual place. And I can sneak stuff down through my ways and my workings through these windows that I use, and I can put a couple hundred dollar bills in your bank account when nobody's looking and nobody will ever figure it out. The Lord's the master cooker of the books. He can fix them all. You say, how did I get to the end of the month and I'm still able to pay the bills? Because the Lord opened the windows of heaven because you trusted him. You say, how did I get through this life on the Lord telling me and leading me to do these things that make absolutely no sense? Sometimes the Lord will tell you to move, and it's time to move. And sometimes the Lord will tell you to sit still, and it's time to sit still. And you say, man, if I do that, I'm missing out on all this opportunity. And the Lord says, can I just be proved one time by you? Can you just check me out and test me? And you can put me on the hot seat, and I'll let you do it. Prove me. You say, I would never talk to the Lord like that. Then you're not scriptural, and you're not biblical, and you're not obeying him. And you don't have that attitude towards the Lord all the time but you won't have to if you do it once. And you prove him, and he says, I can show you how to pour out a blessing, and I can bring you and provide you and take care of your things and take care without the way that you think I have to take care of you, because it's not always in money. My preacher got audited one time, a long, long time ago, it was before I knew him. <clears throat> he was making something like less than $5,000 a year income, he was a student, he was married, he had two kids, he was pastoring while he was a student, trying to start a church, and everything's barely hanging together. Turned in his taxes, the IRS said, you did not turn in your taxes, you did not properly file. And he said, well, how do we do this? So they come over to his house, and they sit down at the kitchen table, and they say, so this is what you show, 4800 and something dollars, and he said, yep, that was my income, that was all I had to report. And they said, it's not possible for you to live here. How much is your rent? And he said, well, my rent is only $100 a month because the church takes care of most of it. And they said, oh. How much is your car payment? He said, oh, I, I, well, that car out there, how did you pay for it? He said, oh, it was given to me by one of the men in the church. And that's, that's what our car we've had for the last two years. Oh. How do you pay for groceries on $5,000 a year because you haven't had enough to even pay your utility bills we see that those are paid but you haven't had enough to even pay for food he said well there's a brother in the church and he raises pigs and he came and brought us over pigs one time and they all butchered up and then this other family in the church they have been buying us groceries and once a month taking care of all of our groceries and then there's another family in the church okay okay we've heard enough sir we've heard enough thank you that's the end of our investigation now i, I wouldn't want to live like that every year but he needed that for some reason. The Lord knew that he needed that for a year or two of his life. And the Lord poured out the windows of blessing, and the IRS had nothing that they could say about it because it didn't add up on their adding machine. It adds up in the Lord's adding machine, and he'll take care of it. 
Okay. That's, that's the best I can tell you on the fountains and the windows and the flat earth and the shape of the universe. If you take every flat earth verse and apply it to the universe, it fits. If you take every flat earth verse and say, it's a square, but it's a circle, but I could see the North Star in the Southern Hemisphere, you're an idiot. If you're online, you're an idiot. In every old concrete boss I can ever think of's voice. Oh, I'll say it again. All right. Lord, I ask that you'd please bless the words in your book. Um, Lord, uh, I think we probably all have to admit that we've been guilty of reading into it what we were taught or what we learned or what we assumed. Lord, I've certainly been guilty of studying something out and having my mind made up before I look at it. And uh, Lord, I probably still have other things i got to learn and undo and teach and preach differently. Lord, I ask you please help us to uh, just check ourselves every once in a while, check the words again, recheck the thing we think we already know in Scripture. It's like you're changing it on us or we're not very smart. I can't figure out which. Lord, I ask you please bless this book and our study of it, that you'd please help us, help us to uh, prove you and just be faithful and stick out the tough times and trust you. Lord, thank you for taking care of us like you said you would. And I ask you please bless everybody here today as they go out for the week. Lord, I ask you please give them something that encourages them and that helps them to uh, see your face this week and, and put a smile on your face. I ask this in your name, your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. You know, I made fun of you, right? I'm a visual learner more so than an auditory. That makes a whole lot more sense. Yeah. You're drawing up there like that. Are we done? Are we offline? <laughs> no, no, I don't mean you. Okay, I haven't shut you off yet. Hit pause or end or stop. <laughs>